All right. Okay. So hi everyone. Uh, welcome. I'm Aurélien, so one of the co-organizers of, of Flow. Uh, so this is along Peter, uh, along with Peter Ristrovic, uh, Virginia Smith, and Ali Star, Samuel Robat, which is here also today, and Sebastian Stitch. So for maybe first uh, first attendees, uh, first time attendees. Uh, so the goal of the Flow seminar is to provide a forum to discuss uh, latest scientific results in all aspects of fidelity learning. We know that this is a very active field at the moment. So we try to cover many topics, uh, which include distributed optimization, learning theory, privacy, security, things around the communication, actually also like uh, in today's talk, uh, but also things related to systems and hardware and, and applications of fidelity learning. Uh, so before I introduce today's speaker, just a, a quick uh, recap of how to ask questions. Uh, by default, your mic should be disabled. Uh, but you can raise uh, your hand, use a raise hand features uh, if you want to ask a question during the talk, or you can write your question in the chat. And so uh, Chuan has agreed to uh, take questions during the talk, so, so feel free to interrupt or to raise your hand and, or ask the question. Uh, we will keep also Samuel and I uh, an eye on the, on the chat to, to let uh, the speaker know when there is a question. All right, so let me introduce the speaker. So today our speaker is Chuan Hugo. Uh, thanks a lot for accepting our invite. So Chuan is a research scientist at uh, Meta in the Fundamental AI Research Team. He received a PhD from Cornell University uh, and he's working uh, okay, on many topics, but I guess these days mostly machine learning security and privacy, in particular things related to adversarial uh, and distributional robustness privacy preserving uh, machine learning, uh, including with different privacy and, and fidelity learning. And so today he will talk about privacy aware compression for fidelity learning and analytics. Uh, so he will essentially show how to tackle compression and different privacy in a kind of holistic way, uh, proposing some schemes that have uh, optimal variance in, in certain settings and also discussing extensions to metric different privacy with applications to geolocation privacy. So really excited to hear about this work. Uh, thanks a lot. And uh, Chuan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Aurelia, for the very, uh, very nice introduction. So uh, today I will be talking about um, a topic that's surrounding uh, federated learning and privacy, and namely how do you uh, differentially privately train and uh, model NFL setting while uh, making the updates communication efficient. Uh, so I'm, this is a work that we will actually be presenting next week at the FL workshop at New Europe's. Um, so if you're coming uh, in person, then we can have a nice chat at the poster as well, if you have any questions there. And so this work is something that um, I'm really quite proud of for two reasons. One is that we're proposing a lot of interesting new techniques for constructing and analyzing private mechanisms, which we can hope, which we hope can be adopted um, in, in the future to to really create new mechanisms from scratch. And uh, if that doesn't sound interesting, uh, the, tech, the practical implication is that we can do differential private FL training with one bit communication without sacrificing any uh, accuracy on top of standard techniques like uh, the Gaussian mechanism. So this is really quite a powerful result that we can really hope to apply in practice. And so um, the talk will be a bit technical. So if there's any question that, you know, if you feel something's unclear, please feel free. Uh, feel free to raise your hand and then um, ask the question there. So to begin, this is a slide you probably have seen thousands of times already, so I'll skip on the details. So basically what we're trying to do is have clients send these local updates, which we denote by M, uh, Xi, and M is the mechanism that uh, that sends this, uh, this update, and then uh, the server wants to do some aggregation, um, and here we denote by A, of the updates uh, in a form. Um, without uh, the clients expo uh, explicitly disclosing their data only through the updates. Right. So there are lots of promises of federated learning, uh, one of which is that the server only learns the aggregate information. And this can be done uh, not naively, like the um, naive formulation will be each client sending their update to the server one by one, uh, but you can make this uh, in a, using secure aggregation so that the server only observes the aggregator update. Uh, so only this aggregate information is revealed to the server. Uh, another promise is that we want the um, learning protocol to be fault tolerant. So say if a few clients drop out or if they're malicious or if they uh, inject some uh, 
poisoning to their data, we can detect or remove them using these uh, Byzantine robust aggregation methods. Another promise is that we want the individual contributions to be privatized. So uh, basically any uh, one client's update, uh, we can protect from um, inference attacks. And this can be done using standard techniques from differential privacy by basically privatizing these local updates. And finally, one more thing I wanna to touch on is uh, communication efficiency because these updates are um, basically up, uh, graded vectors of very large models, uh, and you don't want these to be sent um, from uh, potentially low, low power devices from the client side. So you want to, um, in a sense, compress these updates so that it's uh, communication efficient. So it seems like there are a lot of promises and we have solutions for each of them, uh, but most of the literature, uh, existing literature has more or less studied these uh, promises in isolation. And if you combine these um, in aggregate, then actually some of them are not easy or maybe even conflicting. So one thing that is conflicting is, if, is these two, that if you want to apply secure aggregation, then basically what it's saying is that the server only gets to learn the, the aggregated update. Then that's um, at a high level in conflict with the goal of business robust aggregation, which is uh, saying that you should be able to tell which one of these updates is malicious and potentially remove them, right? So these are kind of conf uh, conflicting goals that are not easy to handle at the same time. Um, that's not what I will be uh, talking about today, but rather the last two are also, uh, in a sense, conflicting. And it's not uh, as obvious as the first two, but I hope to uh, convince you in the next few slides. So as an example, let's start with this, um, this simple mechanism for different privacy. Uh, and the task is, let's say we have a bunch of scalars uh, x1 up to xn uh, in the boundary range zero 1, and we want to compute their mean. So the standard uh, private mechanism, um, the Gaussian mechanism, basically adds Gaussian noise of the suitably chosen standard deviation to these updates, and then um, you can aggregate it uh, at the server end. And so what you can do here is, uh, what I've chosen is that all of these uh, xi's are basically the same value. and the server will, sorry, the, the each client uh, adds noise and the update is sent to the server is shown in this uh, histogram. And you can see the distribution is approximately a Gaussian. And once the server aggregates these, it actually recovers uh, the mean very accurately, right? So this says that if you apply a private mechanism and then the server wants to aggregate, you get a very uh, nice unbiased estimate of the client's updates. Uh, so that's the privacy part. And now the second is if we want to do a um, compression. So the compression here, I give as an example, this randomized dithering. So what we do is we have this grid of B points equally spaced, and we randomly round X, which is within zero one to one of these grid points. So it's the rounding is done so that uh, basically in, in expectation, you recover X anywhere in this range. And if you look at what this will do, is that um, we, uh, so here we simulate again, uh, 100,000 clients and each of them sends an update and it's discretized to one of these two values in the histogram. But when you average them, then you recover exactly again the mean. So what this is saying is that the compression mechanism that we defined here is uh, also a, an unbiased estimate uh, of the actual mean. And so now if you try to combine these two naively, you end up something that's a bit weird. So what I did here is that um, I add the Gaussian noise to the client update, and then I do the dithering compression. So what happens here is that you see the true mean is about 0.8, but the aggregated mean is actually uh, very off. And this is again from 100,000 samples on the scalar. So uh, there's no question about uh, whether the, uh, there's enough samples here to recover the means, really that there is a, an inherent bias in the composition of these two mechanisms. So what this kind of shows is that uh, we need to be a bit careful when designing these two mechanisms together to preserve the statistical validity of the, the update that we recover in the aggregate. So at a high level, 
um, what do we want in the privacy aware compression mechanism that can avoid the catastrophic scenario as in the previous slide. Well, the first is that we want the mechanism to be DP. And here we focus on the local DP setting. So there's no secure aggregation involved. Each client just sends their update to the server um, in, in, uh, in its exact form. And the second requirement is compressions. We want the output of this mechanism to be encoded in B bits. And uh, so for an update vector in FL, we want it to be B bits per coordinate. And the third is that we want asymptotic consistency. This is the property that the previous naive composition does not uh, satisfy, meaning that we want the aggregate of the output of these mechanisms to, to converge to aggregate of the true data um, as the number of samples goes to infinity. So right in the previous um, in the previous slide, this does not happen because the, the true mean is at point A and the aggregated mean is at point six even with a large, very large number of samples. So this is the property that we really wish to have. Um, and one sufficient condition is asymptotic consistency. Uh, of this asymptotic consistency uh, property is unbiasedness. So if we can ensure that the mechanism is unbiased at every X in the interval, then um, we can satisfy property three. So the focus of um, this talk will be, how do we construct a mechanism that can satisfy all of these properties at the same time. So, John, just a quick question. So, so the problem in the previous example was uh, was due to kind of overflow. Uh, yes, exactly. So, it's basically when we do the um, compression, we first clip it to some range, and this clipping operation introduces this bias. Right. Otherwise, you cannot do the quantization in the the Dering grid. Exactly. So, or you would need to adjust the quantization, yes, course, uh, coarseness to 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 account for that, which uh, which would introduce a big loss in the compression. Exactly. Yeah. So there's. So yes, there are. I mean, you can think of solutions to this problem just by expanding the range. But then there's a question of how do you compress that again um, to, right. to find. Right. Right. Um, so I'm going to introduce a strategy that we'll be applying to um, design um, a, a family of mechanisms that can handle um, the requirements one to three. So here we consider as a simple case first, a scalar mechanism that compresses a scalar X within the bound zero one. And um, so the algorithm here is operating in two phases. The offline phase is basically a construction of the mechanism. So uh, in line three, you can see that we have these parameters B out and B in. So uh, the middle B is denoting the number of bits of communication uh, of the output side. And the uh, uh, little B in is the, um, it's, uh, sorry, the capital B in is basically the number of points in the dithering grid that we select. And the process is that we need to construct this sampling probability matrix P. Uh, which is of size b in times b out, and an output of bet a. Uh, and it's done to satisfy uh, epsilon dp and biasness in the, so that the mechanism on the online phase uh, satisfies these two, these two properties. In the online phase, what we do is in line six, we first dither x to the grid, as in showing the, um, a few slides ago how to apply this dithering, so that's unbiased. So basically, the dithering will convert any x in zero one to a discrete um, two point in the discrete set of size B in. And once we recover the index in that um, set, we draw a sample from the categorical distribution defined by the probability vector PI. So P is the matrix. We take the ith uh, uh, row of that matrix and you treat that as the probability vector for the categorical distribution to sample what is the column that we want to output. And the value that we output is um, the J's alphabet. Does this make sense? Yeah, maybe I have another question here. So this unbiasedness constraint here is is on the individual output, or or or, or maybe it's sufficient to have a, a post processing that uh, you know makes makes the aggregated value unbiased. Or okay, can you can you clarify? Right. So here we are requiring that um, 
basically when you take the expectation of the mechanism at each i, the output will be exactly um, i over b minus one, essentially. Okay, because something like randomized response, for instance, would not satisfy unbiasedness, but, but then you can post-process the inputs to, to, to have an unbiased estimate of those sum, right? So, yeah, exactly. Actually, your one slide ahead of me, because I was just going to talk about randomized response in the okay, next okay. slide. So here's a strong, stronger constraint uh, individually for each value. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so the next slide is about um, randomized response and how it's actually an instantiation of the strategy that I uh, showed in the previous slide. So here, what, let's assume that we have already done the dithering process. So now we can consider an X that's in this, uh, in this grid. And the randomized response mechanism in, in its generalized form is it's gonna output X with some probability and randomly uniformly sample it uh, with some other probability probability and the probability is designed so that uh, basically it's epsilon uh, differentially private. And if you look at this mechanism, you can basically construct a P matrix, which is uh, basically a diagonal matrix plus a um, all ones matrix, uh, but weighted appropriately. And so it's, it falls in um, the strategy that I outlined in the previous slide. But if you compute what is the expectation of the mechanism's output, um, you can easily show that it's not equal to X and there is some bias. So the process to make it into unbiasedness is uh, we can correct for it by solving for this alphabet vector. Right? So the output alphabet we still haven't touched and you can arrange this equation so that you, know, you get a solution of these uh, output alphabet vectors. And so now the unbiased version of this randomized response uh, is you output this AI instead of X and this uh, basically A, A1 up to A, B, my, uh, B in uh, instead of the, the grid point values. And this will be uh, exactly one instantiation of what's described in this algorithm one uh, a few slides ago. So this is just one simple example of how you can apply um, the strategy um, using some mechanism that we already know. So that's very nice, uh, but um, it's kind of just um, skirting around the problem of how do we construct uh, mechanisms for the strategy. So um, we give actually a general um, framework for constructing new mechanisms that satisfy these properties. And if you look at what are the conditions uh, one to three? Uh, one to three, basically the um, unbiasedness, the uh, epsilon dp, and so on. Those conditions they translate to these uh, linear constraints that you can place on the probability matrix B and the alphabet A. So one thing is that it's linear in only either P or A, not jointly, because the, actually if you look at one D, the unbiasedness constraint has a, a quadratic form, but um, uh, and it makes this solving of the P and alpha uh, and the uh, alphabet a bit um, harder, but uh, I'll treat that more or less as a black box. And for now, these are constraint functions that we can place on P and A. And so the objective of the MVU mechanism is that we want to construct a mechanism that satisfies all of these so they satisfy the conditions one to three in uh, one of the earliest slides while minimizing the variance. And the variance is a very uh, important thing to minimize because that controls essentially how accurate your estimate is at the server end. So we want to minimize it so the server requires as few samples as possible to recover the true mean. So now we have a proper optimization problem. We have an objective, which is we want to minimize the expected variance of the mechanism. And we have these constraints um, that we can formulate into a problem uh, that one can solve. The actual optimization is not that interesting, uh, but let's say there is a black box that can yield uh, a mechanism given these constraints. And we call that the uh, MBU or minimum variance unbiased mechanism. So just to give an example of what this mechanism looks like, here we have, um, the P matrix and the alphabets uh, for 
a chosen set of values. So the B in and B out are basically three each. So I have the P matrix is an eight by eight matrix and the output, the number of uh, bits that the mechanism outputs is three. And here, what we can uh, we um, vary is the epsilon parameter in DP. So we go from left to right as epsilon is one up to 10. And you can see on the very right, when epsilon is 10, um, it's basically outputting a diagonal, which is uh, which makes sense, right? Because there's no privacy constraint, then you might as well just output whatever you're given. And on the very left, you can see that's respecting the epsilon DP constraint because each column, the entries are more or less similar, right? We want like the, the DP constraint requires basically for every column, the uh, values are bounded within some range. Um, and so this is what um, it's satisfying. And you can see also on the bottom, so the output alphabet, uh, it needs to be stretched out a bit to satisfy the unbiasedness constraint. So this is uh, what happens if you um, try to construct these mechanisms for various values of epsilon. And now if you apply this mechanism in practice, so here we show a very simple um, example with a scalar distributed mean estimation. Uh, and the scalars are given as values between negative one and one. Um, previously, I said this should be between zero and one, but you can always scale any range to zero and one just using a scalar. And so what this is doing is that we have these scalars uh, and we scale it to zero one and then we apply the MVU mechanism and then scale it back to, to show these plots. And these plots are um, sh shown. So the x-axis is what the value of the xi is, and all of them are equal to some the same value of x. And the y-axis is the variance of the mechanism. And so if you see from the very left, then these mechanisms um, have you know, a, a certain variance, and we can compare it to the Laplace mechanism, which is showing the dashed line. So, um, and also the colors indicate that when B is equal to one, that's the lighter green and B is equal to three, which, which is we have three bits of communication, it's in the darker green. So um, as uh, maybe as expected, when you have a greater communication budget, you can achieve a lower variance. And going to epsilon equals to five, uh, in fact, then three bits of communication is sufficient to achieve the same level of performance as the Laplace mechanism. You can see here the variance is exactly the same and the epsilon uh, is also calibrated. So that's equal to that of the Laplace. So this is already something that can be um, easily applied to a scalar problem um, and with three bits of communication instead of like, uh, let's say 16 bits if you are using a floating point 16 representation. Um, but this is, of course, not the problem that we care about in any practical setting because compressing a scalar, there's really no need for communication efficiency anyways, because it's just a few bits. And so really what we care about is compressing vectors. And compressing vectors, especially in FL, there uh, is an interesting geometry problem. Namely that um, in, in private training, a lot of the time we want to compress L2 bounded vectors. So like in the classical uh, DPHD paper, uh, what we need to do is comp uh, for each sample, we need to control the L2 norm of that um, sample's gradient, and then add a suitably uh, calibrated Gaussian noise to that. So this really needs to work under this L2 geometry. And so, one naive solution for making MV, extending MVU to vectors is let's say we just compose it over coordinates. We apply it independently for each coordinate. We know that each mechanism is epsilon dp. So the composition is basically d times of that, where d is the number of dimensions of the vector. This will work for the L, L infinity geometry, but not the L2 geometry. Because uh, basically under the L2 geometry, all we can do um, is that we upper bound the, sorry, we uh, upper bound the L2 norm using the L infinity norm. Uh, and this will create a large amount of overestimation of how big, um, how large the L2 norm is. So we really need to adapt the accounting of this mechanism to the L2 geometry instead of naively composing it over the coordinates. And, um, and 
this L2 geometry is really what happens in any application of uh, DPHD to uh, either centralized or federated learning training. So to fix this naive solution, um, we come up with this better, smarter solution. And what the solution does is, let's first look at what the MVU mechanism is doing. So the MVU mechanism, the dithering process essentially does a linear interpolation between two rows of the P matrix. So here, when X is between this I and I plus one, we take the two rows of um, the P matrix, PI and AI plus one, and we do a linear interpolation essentially to uh, construct the sampling probability matrix for X. So what we are changing here for the interpolated MVU is now we're doing uh, this interpolation, which is inter linearly interpolating in the natural parameter space or the log density space. So you can, the natural parameter space is really uh, in a sense that uh, this is a, an exponential family um, distribution, the categorical distribution. So you can express uh, its sampling parameter in this natural parameter space and, um, and it's an, a linear interpolation in that space. Uh, any questions so far? No, it doesn't, uh, doesn't look like it. Okay. So why do we want to do this weird um, interpolation in the log density or in the natural parameter space? Uh, so the advantage it gives is that we can use a much more powerful privacy accounting to, um, to tightly bound how much privacy leakage it is for the L2 geometry. And I will give a, uh, a quick sketch of the proof because I think the technical is actually very interesting and revealing about uh, um, how to analyze these mechanisms. So the idea is that we can express, um, we can give a rainy DP guarantee. And what we do is express the rainy divergence using this Taylor expansion. So what this expansion will do is we expand up to the second order term and the second, sorry, we expand up to the first order term and we bound the residual using the second order term. So here I'm writing out the, the three terms. So, so the first term is when we want to um, look at two samples, uh, x1, x2, and measure the divergence in distribution of their output, the first term is when we replace x2 by x1. So this is zero because we have you know, basically two points that are the same. So we have two distributions that are equal. So their divergence is zero. So the second term is now we want to look at the, the rate of change at this x1 uh, equals the x1 divergence. And this is also zero because we're looking at a global minimum when uh, things are equal to zero. So this term we can also cross out. So the only thing that's left in this Taylor expansion is this second order term, uh, which is measuring the curvature of this uh, divergence. So now let's cancel out all the terms and, and only leave it with the second order term. And this is something now that's written as a sort of quadratic form in terms of the difference between x2 and x1. And um, this quadratic form, the, the, the latter part, um, you can actually bound for exponential family distributions, which is one of the core reasons why we need to do this uh, interpolation in the log density space uh, by the constant. So essentially for, uh, for any alpha, if you want to look at the um, range divergence of order alpha, you can bound this term by alpha times M for a universal constant M that we can compute. So M is um, the Fisher information constant is for anyone who knows what that is. And it's essentially measuring the curvature of this divergence function. So um, here in summary, what this whole derivation shows is that we can bound the rain divergence as a function of this X2 minus X1 squared. And what this will give is now that handling L2 bounded vectors becomes easy. So because what we can do is we can sum the rainy divergence across coordinates. And when you sum it across coordinates, um, the x2 minus x1 term turns to this L2 norm squared. So anytime you have a handle on the um, and on the L2 norm of a vector, you can plug it into this 
a formula and it'll give you an upper bound on the Rainy divergence for any alpha. Um, so this is actually, uh, the proof is a very straightforward extension of the privacy proof for uh, bacterial Laplace and Gaussian mechanism using the same principle. So now um, I want to show some experiments for uh, this interpolated MBU mechanism and in application to feather the learning. So the first thing is um, in the, essentially we're replacing the Gaussian mechanism with the uh, MVU or the interpolated MVU mechanism. And here what it's um, doing in the context of FL is you can treat each sample as one client. So it's uh, in a sense at a client level, um, uh, but sample size one regime. And so the baselines here that we consider are uh, one is the Gaussian mechanism with no compression. Two is the sign HDD baseline. So the sign HDD, many of you may be familiar. So here what it's doing is adding Gaussian noise and then outputting the sign, which is actually a very strong baseline that's quite hard to beat. And what um, we compare against these two is the uh, mechanism that we defined earlier, the MBU and the interpolated MBU mechanisms. So in the plot, uh, what we're showing on the x-axis is the DP epsilon at a fixed level of delta. And the conversion is done in a standard way from Rennie DP to DP. And each, um, in the plot, we are showing a bunch of points uh, as a scatter plot. So these scatter plots corresponding to uh, different hyperparameter settings. So you can change the learning rate, change the, uh, the clipping magnitude, change the uh, amount of noise to add. And all of these basically uh, give you different type of epsilon versus um, model utility trade-off. So we plot all of those and take the Pareto frontier as the stash line. So this is, the Pareto frontier is really representing what is the optimal privacy utility trade-off for these various um, private compression mechanisms. And so on the left uh, is this training done on MNIST. And you can see here, uh, sign HDD is, actually a pretty decent baseline. It's very close to all of these other mechanisms. And what we view as an upper bound for performance is the Gaussian mechanism with no compression. Uh, and you can see here the IMVU, which is the uh, interpolation in the log density space mechanism that we defined earlier. It's um, doing so with one bit communication per coordinate of the update. And uh, it's almost exactly matching the performance of the Gaussian. So you can see here, at, at least for MNIST, you can achieve for every epsilon the same level of model performance at one bit communication using this mechanism. And for CVAR10, we observe uh, the same kind of trend, but now the gap is a bit larger. So sign HD, there is a wider gap between that and that of Gaussian mechanism with no compression. But with one bit communication, again, the IMVU can achieve uh, again, the same performance as that of the Gaussian mechanism across the whole range of epsilons. Uh, any question about this set of results? Uh, yes, I, I would have one. I would be curious here that, okay, so if you tune Gaussian and uh, you then run it with your uh, MVU, does it work for like the same parameters or you actually have to do some tuning to get to recover the Gaussian performance, like a pure Gaussian performance? Um, sorry, can you, can you explain what you mean by tune the Gaussian? So, so yeah, so, so, so what do you, as, as far as I get it, like what do you uh, present here is like, okay, let, let's just take Gaussian. So, so you like the, this, this part of the frontier is the best setup for Gaussian, right? Right. Right. Yes. So, so now if you take uh, that hyperparameter setting that you obtain that actually leads to the best part uh, to, to the best performance for Gaussian, and now you use it for your uh, interpolated MVU that you only change the that you only add compression mechanism, do you get the same performance, or actually you have to perform some additional hyperparameter tuning to recover that performance? Oh, I see. Okay, I see what you mean. Um, I. I don't know for sure how that will exactly work because the so the Gaussian mechanism the the parameter of that is the sigma, right? Yeah. And for the IMVU, it's not exactly there's no corresponding sigma 
there. So that part, there's no direct translation from what would be the hyperparameter for Gaussian to that of the IMU. Okay, okay, I see. Right. Like as, as but, you, yeah. you can also think of it as a process that I have the sigma and I can reach some epsilon, epsilon for that uh, mechanism and I have some hyperparameter for IMVU and I can reach some sigma for that uh, for that choice, but there's no conversion from the epsilon mm -hmm. backwards directly. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, uh, I just want to show one last slide for the result is now let's look at an actual uh, more feathered learning flavor um, benchmark. So here uh, we're considering sample level DP on this uh, FEMNIST data set I'm sure many of you are familiar with. And here, uh, just as a quick reminder, each client has a predefined split of this FEMNIST data set, which is handwriting recognition and extended alphabet. Uh, and each client samples uh, set as 230 samples each approximately. So that's the kind of the median or the mean. Uh, and there's a various uh, range for each client. And what we're considering here is sample level differential privacy. So we want um, each, so the, the, the change in any client's one sample to be in, uh, indistinguishable in terms of the model output or the client's uh, update for that, for that matter. Um, and here we have um, the same set of baselines. So we have the sine HD, we have the interpolated MBU and the Gaussian. And here also the sine HD is um, a strong baseline, but it's a bit below that of the Gaussian, while the interpolated MBU with one bit communication is again matching the performance of the Gaussian. Um, so here basically with the two set of um, experiments, what I want to convey is that anytime uh, where you want to have a local DP guarantee with communication efficiency, uh, instead of the Gaussian, you can replace it with the IMU and it would do just as well. And it will have a at least a 16 times um, communication benefit um, when compared to 14.16 representation. Um, so to conclude, um, basically that's um, what I mentioned, but under the hood, there are a lot of technical contributions that I uh, try to highlight a bit. Hopefully it's not too confusing, um, but basically one is how do we numerically construct new DP mechanisms under this um, MVU optimization framework? Uh, and that is of course only one instance of what you can define. So we have a set of constraints, but the objective really is something that you can always change um, to suit your own flavor. Uh, and this is a general technique that you can use to construct and analyze new DP mechanisms. And the second is that we can, we have this numerical way to analyze privacy, which is also something that we think is, uh, is, is quite new in that these analysis can also be, a, be numerically done to analyze any uh, mechanism that you construct numerically. So I really hope that these, um, technical contributions can also be um, more popular in the in, in future work, and we can really expand the frontier of what's possible for federal learning and differential privacy uh, with different constraints. So that's all for my presentation. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, very nice presentation. So, do we have some some questions from the audience? Yes, there is a one question from Steve. Let me try to oh, yeah. unmute Steve. Yes. Yes, uh, thanks very much. Very interesting talk. I was curious, if, is there a, an equivalent kind of framework? That this was apparently for discrete uh, alphabets. Um, I, are there equivalents for sort of continuous valued problems? I'm thinking about like you know, time series forecasting, those kinds of um, and or, um, uh, yeah, yeah, those would be kind of the, the applications I was also interested in. Right, that is a very interesting question. We did think about that a bit. Um, it's much more difficult because here, um, I want to go back to a few slides ago. Um, so here, basically what will happen is that the sampling probability matrix P wouldn't be a matrix, it will be a, it'll be a set of functions. 
right? Mm -hmm. Because when you have continuous right. output, mm -hmm. what you're sampling is from a function. Um, like you can still have the input be discrete, but the output must be a, a function on a continuous space. So this is something that's, at least we don't know at the moment how to solve, uh, but maybe if there are any experts on um, perhaps differential equations, that's one thing I can think of that can help with this. Um, mm -hmm. That would be a great extension. Gotcha. Cool. Yeah, thanks very much. I was just curious about that, but great, uh, great talk. Thank you. Uh, uh, maybe, uh, maybe just a, a simple question on, on this uh, Fisher information. Can you discuss a little bit more, you know, the typical value that this takes? I mean, I mean and, and the influence of this, this constant? Uh, right, so the Fisher information constant, um, actually I can expand a whole lot about, uh, upon that if there's time, but I, I don't think uh, there, there really is that much. But this is something I feel is um, very underexplored in terms of both analyzing these, um, these private mechanisms and also using it as a form of, of privacy guarantee. Because what it's saying is it's measuring the curvature of this rain divergence. So in other words, how quickly is the divergence changing with respect to x1 or x2, right? With respect to, to the input. Um, and that is something that's in a bit in contrast to um, the traditional notion of differential privacy, which is all about the maximum change possible when you swap out x1 for x2. And so the Fisher information is really in a, a bit more closer flavor to metric DP which is also looking at a, a kind of rate of change problem. So in the scalar case, it's exactly the, the epsilon in the, metric, in the metric DP sense with the L2 uh, metric, L2 square metric. But in general, you can use it. Um, it's, it's more of a generalization when X1, X2 are uh, kind of high dimensional vectors. I see, I see. So in particular, these, these uh, guarantees that you get, uh, maybe it was in the next slide or the previous slide, I, I don't know, remember. So, so uh, they can, this yeah, one? here, yeah, yeah. So, so they can be seen uh, as kind of de de data dependent, right? Data dependent privacy loss, which is also some, so something that some people try to explore a bit. I mean, it might be a bit related to things like local sensitivity or, yes. I don't know, it's, right? Yeah. yeah, exactly. It's very related. I mean, here, um, here, at least the M bound, it's still, we're trying to be more um, in line with existing literature and what the guarantee is. So this is nothing data dependent, but in fact, yes. So this quantity, if you don't upper bound it for any X, uh, but rather upper bound it depending on what X is, it will be a data dependent quantity that then you can do a lot of very interesting data dependent analysis, which is Something uh, we did earlier in, in uh, last year's UAI and also besides ML papers, explore how to do, how to use, how to use sufficient information itself as privacy metric and, you know, all the properties that satisfies in terms of data dependent, uh, more fine grained data um, privacy notion. Right. And I guess in the next slide, so the expression that you get, this general expression that you get, uh, I guess, if you consider, let's say, Gaussian mechanism with, and you assume bounded the L2 sensitivity, then you can recover the, the classic bound there from this expression. It's kind of like a generalization of. Yes. Yes. Of this. Okay. Nice. Uh, I have uh, maybe one or two other questions, but maybe there are uh, there are more people who want to ask questions. Right, uh, maybe not. So maybe I can ask another one if you don't mind. Um, so there is, so maybe you can get back to your your curves uh, for the one D case where you were you were kind of showing the the variance. Uh, yes, exactly. So so the, you're probably aware of that. So there is there is some recent work that kind of characterized or showed that for for the for the differentially private sum problem, uh, the amount of Let's say there is a relation between how much you can compress and the privacy budget, and in particular, you can show the, something quite intuitive, uh, right? Is that if you want a lot of privacy, then you can actually compress more 
without losing anything, right? Kind of compression comes for free in some regimes, which right. is intuitive, right. but I think there is only quite recent work that precisely characterized this in, in a kind of optimal way. Right. Uh, so this seems to be also what's uh, maybe unsurprising me, right? Because you optimize the variance. Uh, what seems to be happening here, maybe as we go to the left, we see that the loss of, you know, going from three bits to one bit is, is kind of uh, reducing as epsilon goes to, to zero. Yeah. I was wondering whether there's a way to uh, analyze this formally in your framework or, or not beyond numerically looking at, you know, what's, what, what's happening. Right, exactly. I, I think that's also the um, kind of the motivation for our work um, too, in that once you have uh, enough noise that you want to introduce into the mechanism, it's removing all the information you have about the input so you can compress that with fewer bits, right? And as you correctly pointed out, the gap between one, one and three here on, on the very left is much smaller. But I think for our mechanism, at least, um, it's more of, it's really more of a numerical construction and a numerical analysis framework. So here in the plot, you can definitely see numerically this is happening, um, but theoretically how to prove that um, the output of the uh, of solving this uh, optimization problem with B is three or one is very small. Um, that's, we, we don't know exactly how to show at the moment. Okay, yeah, makes sense, makes sense. And then maybe maybe, maybe one, one other thing oh. I can point out is, so here, I'm like, in fact, um, the the uh, vectors, the, these P matrices, once you get from epsilon is 10 to, down to one, they become more and more low rank. Like you can actually cross out a lot of these columns and it wouldn't matter, right? So this, in a sense, uh, numerically showing that you don't need as many bits as uh, you allow it to in this construction of the mechanism. And the optimization problem is finding that precisely. I see, I see, yes, indeed. Uh, and I was just wondering also a bit about this output alphabet. So is there any, any interesting insight to, to get from the optimization of this alphabet? And uh, uh, I don't know whether whether we can always achieve unbiasedness uh, in, in all regimes or in how the alphabet maybe looks like in, in, in practice. Right, so this is uh, again, very, um, very interesting question and something we did try to, to analyze. And our conclusion was that um, basically when epsilon goes down to zero, um, there will be no unbiased mechanism with finite variance. Um, Simply because you you like when epsilon zero, you, you require all of the um, rows of p to be the same, right? And then so the the there is no no way to solve for a so that you can get unbiasedness. And this is more and more so uh, in the optimization sense also that the p matrices become more and more um, um, low rank so that the solution for a is actually very unstable. So there is. So the one thing I did not mention about how to solve it here is that we did not try to solve for lower epsilon. We did not try to solve the exactly unbiased mechanism because exactly that it will have a very high variance if you want it to be fully unbiased, but rather have the, the bias as a, penal, uh, as a penalty term in the optimization so that you can kind of balance between the, the bias and the variance. I see, I see, interesting. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, very cool, very cool work. Uh...